Welcome to the Israel Bible Podcast. My name is Cindy Parker, and I am an author, speaker, and the professor of Holy Land Studies at the Israel Bible Center. I am passionate about reading the Bible in the physical, historical, and cultural context of its day. And I love having geeky conversations with people about new things. In this podcast, I'd like to invite you to join me as I sit down each week with other faculty members and guests at IBC to discover new aspects of the Bible. These are some of my favorite dialogues because as a modern audience reading an ancient text, we know that the Bible does not need to be rewritten, but it needs to be reread. Today on the podcast, we are joined again by Professor Pinhas Shear, who is the Associate Professor of Ancient Cultures at Israel Bible Center. He teaches several popular courses, one of which is a series called Stories of the Jewish Church. And we are talking about his newly released part three in that series, which covers Acts chapters 10 through 15. Last week, we talked about the remarkable shift in the story that takes place at Cornelius' house in Caesarea, but then we move to chapter 11, and Luke, the author of the text, takes us to Antioch. In his course, Pinhas uses all kinds of maps, which I totally appreciate, but we cannot do that here on the podcast. So I asked him to start with Acts 11, verses 20 to 21, when Luke casually mentions that there are men from Cyprus and Cyrene who go to Antioch to teach the Greeks as well as the Jews the good news. There is a lot of assumed data in this short sentence. Who are these people and where are these places and why does it matter? So lean in and enjoy the conversation. Sure. So um, a a lot of people uh, who study ancient history need to realize that a lot of Jews lived outside of Jerusalem, outside of Judea, even outside of Samaria, and all those areas um, way, way outside um, in other countries, sort of say, at that point. Some by choice, some not by choice. Uh, Basically, as a result of war, many people were captured and taken into slavery, and some of them were born in all these different cities and all these different lands. They grew up, they know the local custom, the local languages, and they even though they are part of that society, they still retain their connection with Jerusalem. So you see actually people in Acts 2 in Jerusalem, and they're Jews from all over, right? And when all the speaking that happens, they all hear their own languages. Well, by their own languages, they mean the languages of the lands in which they have been living lately, or maybe the lands which where they were born, but you know, their connection to Jerusalem. So they make a pilgrimage and all of a sudden, wherever their little, little town they're from, they're hearing that same dialect and they're amazed. And to them, that's a sign from God that this is something absolutely supernatural going on. And so you have Phoenicia, uh, you have Antioch, you have Cyprus, and you have Jews from those areas. Now, if you go, you know, obviously not having the map, you know, it's hard for people to imagine, but I say anyone pick up a a Bible map, an atlas, and just look up where those places are. And you basically are moving up the coastline from Jerusalem. If you just keep going north, eventually you pass through uh, those lands uh, and, and you get to Antioch and then the uh, the sea, the Mediterranean Sea kind of ends right there. And, and you have a tiny little island called Cyprus. And so you're still not too far. Uh, you're within reasonable travel, but many people were um, born there and, and raised there because many of them were slaves. And some of them might have become free. They earned their freedom. And now they had the ability to travel and do what they wanted. Uh, to do. And maybe they were second generation or even third generation slaves. We don't really know much about them uh, besides the fact that they were Jews who grew up in those Greek speaking areas. And it's curiously that this is what God actually used their ability to uh, be comfortable in that society, in the Greek speaking society and not be phased, sort of say, by a lot of that context in which they grew up and still be able to reach out uh, to people in that in their own context. And so essentially, these are the Jews who understand the non-Jewish culture more than the Jews who are living in Jerusalem or in Yafo or even in Caesarea, you know, things like that. So that's this is the amazing part. These are the people whom God ends up using because they end up speaking to people 
um, actually completely by accident, um, because Acts 11 says that they spoke to no one but Jews at all. It is that, that they, own, they would travel to a city and they'd find other Jews, go to synagogue, and they would share what they've seen, what they've heard, what they've experienced. And that's, that was the plan. But then all of a sudden, they went into a public place, place and des- decided to speak to non-Jews. And all, all of a sudden, non-Jews started embracing this idea of what happened. And that was a complete surprise. I, I, they were not prepared for just this. Peter was not prepared uh, to sort of say cross these cultural lines. They accidentally crossed these cultural lines in the cities way outside of Israel now. And all of a sudden, God is doing what he does. He's doing his part in transforming people's lives. And they cannot deny that transformation anymore. Just like Peter, he sees the manifestation of the Spirit. He says, I can't deny that this is for real. How can I say that, you know, they're not worthy to be baptized because they've already received the gift of the Spirit? The same thing happens here. Uh, essentially, these new people are welcomed into uh, a community uh, of believers and followers of Jesus because something amazing is happening in their lives. They're turning to God, which has not happened in the non-Jewish population before. This is, it's not like the non-Jewish world has never heard of this monotheistic message in one God before. They, they probably have, but all of a sudden a shift is happening. And all of a sudden, like they're, now they're ready to hear this message. Now they're ready to accept, uh, what has been proclaimed since the days of Abraham, you know, believe in one God, sort of say. In Acts, if you pay attention to some of these details, you see, although Luke is going to focus on Peter and then later on Paul, we see that there are all kinds of people who are spreading the good news. And so we have these Jews who are down in Africa on the southern coast of the Mediterranean Sea who are instigating this whole spreading of the gospel. And it's just a good reminder when we pay attention to the details that it wasn't just Peter and Paul who were responsible for the spread, but there were a lot of people who were involved in the message. Yeah. And a lot of people traveled. And this is, again, this is being a Jewish society. You know, people don't think about Cyrene uh, as a place a lot, but I find Cyrene absolutely fascinating. I love the ruins of Cyrene. Uh, To me, it's a very interesting place and how Jews ended up there and their stories always intrigue me. But it it is the people of Cyrene that become sort of say famous, or let's say Simon of Cyrene is the famous one, you know, because he actually gets to help Jesus by carrying uh, a part of the execution stake. So, you know, everybody's like, oh, okay, Simon of Cyrene, he must be African. Yes, African Jew, that is. <laughs> uh, because most people in Cyrene uh, were actually, you know, transplants from other places. They, you know, Greeks came and later Romans came. And so the city was essentially a, a big, huge Hellenistic city. And in Africa, the kind of the uh, people from the Mediterranean took over. So, and Jews are a part of that mix. Yeah, it's part of that whole Mediterranean world where they're facing each other, going, using shipping lanes, basically, to go across the Mediterranean Sea and connect with one another. I wanted to go back. I do believe it is Antioch for the first time that we have a church that is a blend of Jews and Gentiles, right? I mean, that would be Antioch because this is where we're starting to get the Greek audience also starting to accept this message. Yeah, we, we don't really know that much historically about uh, Antioch. I mean, we know that Antioch had a Jewish community, and we know that these new Christ followers uh, were also there, and they were non-Jews, and how much they were integrated into a Jewish community or they were not integrated at all, uh, we don't actually know that much about that. And there's a lot of a lot of papers recently have been written about the, the extent of the integration that happened or not, or did they actually form a whole new sort of say uh, assembly for them and, and focused on teaching them uh, the things that, that would not have been needed to be taught uh, to Antioch Jews because Antioch Jews have been going to synagogue all their entire life. So they don't need those basics and that, that understanding. So... But yes, Antioch is, is the place. It's a you know it's a big it's a sizable city, so um, with with very diverse population, and and that's where we sort of say have these 
this mass, sort of say now, a, a group that's large enough to constitute a perhaps even an independent standing group of people who might have been god fearers or just pagans now uh, embracing this new idea. And the truth is the apostles don't really know what to do with them. They, they send for Saul, you know, uh, of Tarsus. And if you look at the map uh, uh, and find where Tarsus is, where Shaul, where Paul is from, actually, it's really not that far from Antioch. I mean, it, it really is almost in the same neighborhood. So it would not have been a huge stretch for him to, to come. So he, uh, out of all the people, he probably understands their culture uh, more than anybody else. Because, again, he grew up right around that area. He would know even the most local customs and any kind of local traditions and people and rulers and local deities. He would have known all of this colloquial stuff, so to say. And that makes him actually a perfect person to come. And so he comes and for the entire year, he teaches there and the community grows even more. And that's when essentially we have this word Christianos appear. This is where this idea of Christians appears you know, and, and, you know, look, we're, we're, in that, we're way into Acts now. You know, people say, well, the church was born, in, you know, Acts chapter two. I'm like, well, Christians didn't get appeared until Acts chapter 11. <laughs> you know, how did that happen? <laughs> Antioch becomes really important for Paul. He seems to, he goes back and touches base. It becomes almost home base at the end of all of his journeys. He's always oriented towards Jerusalem, but he always goes home to Antioch. There has to be something special for him in this first community that he really helps establish and grow. I think it becomes sort of say a testing ground for him in many ways. I think it becomes a base of operations because he's established relationships with these people and he gets a lot of his support from that area. And it's much closer than going all the way back to uh, Jerusalem, of course. So yes, it's, it's natural that it becomes an area because now you actually have a community that's working in that area. So this is important thing about uh, Paul is that remember he is the one earlier uh, in the book of Acts he's the one who receives the calling, and when he has this vision, when he has his transformation, when he has this realization of what it is that God wants from him, it's very clear that the message that he's going to testify to the nations that's going to be a really big part of his calling, and so he comes into that uh, essentially. Uh, for a long time, he doesn't testify to the nations. He actually goes on to everywhere. Uh, but but eventually, he starts to embrace this idea more and more. And I think Antioch naturally becomes a place, you know, for him. Because again, all the networks, all the connections, there's uh, the social networks in that world are, are so important. This is something we, we tend to forget because we're very independent, you know, and but social networks are everything. We do eventually stop talking about maps and the memories of culture held in certain places. So I brought up another topic highlighted in Stories of the Jewish Church, Part 3. Pinha spends time talking about synagogue and what the concept of that word synagogue really is, especially because in subsequent chapters, Paul and Barnabas start on their first travel and they go out to the synagogues first. And it's quite common for many of us to think synagogue is a Jewish term or a Jewish concept. But Pinhas offers a different explanation. How should we understand the word synagogue? And what is the role that it would have played in the Jewish community and throughout the Roman Empire? Yeah, so we can talk about that. There's a lot of misunderstandings about the synagogue, actually. And so an ancient synagogue, modern synagogue... Uh, Ancient synagogue, modern synagogue, very different things, essentially. So we have now, living in the modern world, has established very clear lines. So if I say synagogue, everybody says, okay, that's Jewish. If I say church, everybody say, okay, that's non-Jewish, right? And we have drawn these clear lines. But as people read the New Testament would they have to realize that wasn't the case back in those days. And so I give quite a few examples of what the word synagogue actually means in Greek language and how it was used, and that both Jews and non-Jews used 
the word synagogue. So just because you come across a word synagogue, don't assume this is a Jewish religious gathering. That is such a hard habit to break. <laughs> it is. It is it, hard. It, it's terrible. Uh, so it, w once we have gotten into thinking a particular way, you know, and the same thing with, with, with the church, you know, I, I play a lot of with Hebrew and Greek in my course, and I just, you know, have fun with people. And I just say, okay, you know, the word knesia means church in, in, in Hebrew. Well, the word kanes, uh, kanas means together, right? Okay, well, do you know what the synagogue is called in Hebrew? Because by the way, synagogue is not a Hebrew word. It's a Greek word. But what is the Hebrew word for synagogue? Beit Knesset, Knesset, Kness. You hear that? Oh, Knesia means church, and Beit Knesset means a synagogue in Hebrew. Guess what? Same exact root, same exact word, actually, in Hebrew. But when we travel between Hebrew and Greek and English and back and forth, all of that linkage gets lost. And now we have established these words, and we use them the way we use them. So essentially, we kind of superimpose the meanings that are common to us back into the text. And when we read Acts in this way, we really get bewildered when uh, when it says that, you know, the disciples go into the synagogue of the Jews. And you're like, well, what other kind of synagogue is there? <laughs> you know, right. if, that, if there's the synagogue of the Jews, well, there must be the synagogue of the non-Jews. <laughs> and that's exactly my point. You know, don't, just because you hear the word ecclesia, don't automatically assume, oh, that's the church. I'm like, no, by the way, that's probably a Jewish place too. Or just because you hear the word synagogue, don't assume that, that, oh, that's a Jewish place of worship. Well, no, that could be just very pagan as well. So these terms are much more fluid in the New Testament, and we want to assign our meanings to them. And this is where we get caught in a trap, essentially, and, and fall into that bad habit and start interpreting things by looking through our modern lenses. And so I constantly challenge my students to stop looking that way, adopt a much more ancient, much more nuanced look by understanding, by using a simple language like this of how things like that could be so misleading. Speaking of using modern context, you were talking about when we use terms like synagogue and church, and we think Jewish, non-Jewish, but we also think a specific kind of building where I'm not entirely convinced that we're supposed to take any, even that idea with us into the ancient text, because it's not, they met in all kinds of places. It was an assembly, right? So it could be in someone's home. It could be in a public place. And so it, are we supposed to be thinking a synagogue building in a particular city? Buildings are actually an afterthought. And so this is what people have to realize. So in, in, in some ways, Judaism hasn't actually changed that much. So at least some forms of Judaism. So today, you know, people who are familiar with Hasidic Judaism, for example, they would note a lot of synagogues are small and they're actually house synagogues. That's what they are. A lot of times the rabbi might live with his family on the second floor and the first floor is where everyone can come, come and prays. You know, like you have the big, huge room on the first floor and that's where everybody comes. But the rabbi actually lives upstairs with his family. And so they're the caretakers of the space. But at the same time, it's, it's a small little house synagogue. And that still goes on actually in modern day in Hasidic Judaism. And I do believe that some synagogues were private in those days. And some synagogues were public. So the private synagogues, of course, would have met in homes in private dwellings, and they would have been by invitation only. And um, the public ones could be meeting in the town hall or in the library or in the some open civic building out there that's that's used by public. In fact, many synagogues were did exactly that. They shared cities facilities because synagogues at that time were not strictly uh, used for prayer only. People conducted all sorts of communal affairs in the synagogue. They weren't necessarily houses of worship. They were more like community centers, if you think about it that way, in those days. And so that, again, a lot of this stems from people's lack of familiarity of what modern synagogues are like, and what ancient synagogues used to be like. And we just kind of want to embrace this idea of a designated building that's assigned to worship. And this is where people get together on such and such day. It's a bit more fluid when it comes to the ancient world. You also mentioned the term ecclesia. So how does that 
play into synagogue? How is it similar or different from synagogue? I mean, to me, it's uh, this is another one of those terms that's basically used practically synonymously. In some places, ecclesia means exactly that, a gathering of Jews. Could be a religious gathering, could be a non-religious gathering. And synagogue can mean the same exact thing. It can mean uh, a gathering. So these are all terms that are not imbued with religious context, is what I'm trying to say. The word ecclesia is not a religious word. It's not a Christian word at all. And the word synagogue is not a Jewish word. It's also not a religious word. It's just a word for gathering. And there were a number of these words for gathering and assembly of, of all sorts. And so we just get stuck in using them in a very, very specific way because we have stopped using them in a generic way. But I just propose retranslating all of these translations to just put the word assembly everywhere. Or gathering and that will fix it because it will make the text actually read the way it was meant to be read by using these generic broad terms it's what is so fun about courses like yours is having a chance to kind of pause set the culture set the time period set the language and then reread the story and go oh <laughs> that is interesting <laughs> that's what i challenge people to do because we get stuck in a rut yeah and, and we, we, do. we come up with we come up with interpretations that are almost predictable because the path has been laid out for us we've talked about this before on the podcast the danger of reading our own cultural assumptions into the text, or the fact that some stories are so familiar that we start reading into the text something that actually is not there. It's always a great exercise to take a moment, ask about the cultural, geographical, and linguistic context, and then read the passage carefully one more time. If you love this kind of exercise, join us at IBC, where you have access to so many amazing courses that dig into these kinds of details about culture and interpretation. You can even earn credit towards Israel Bible Center Certificate Program in Jewish Context and Culture. Thank you to Jeremy McDonald from Mason Jar Music for doing an amazing job editing, mixing, and adding in all the good music. And thank you for hanging out with me and being curious about all things Bible-related. 